Ladies and gentlemen, this time we're going to begin the funeral services of Mr. Andrew Wolf. Rabbi Mayor Shimon Moskowitz will be officiating. We ask everyone here to please be sure that your masks are on while you're sitting. If anybody's speaking, you can take them off. Also, please be sure that your cell phones have been to the, turned to the quiet mode. We welcome those of you who are joining us on Zoom. This time we're going to begin the sacred funeral ceremony of Mr. Andrew Wolf. We are gathered here this morning to bid farewell, pay our respects, and mourn the passing of Mr. Andrew Wolf, Avraham ben Chaim. In the Hebrew language, the word for a funeral is levaya. Levaya means to accompany. Unlike the English word funeral, which means finale, the end, but the word Leviah indicates that we accompany the soul of Andrew from one world to the next, from one reality, from one dimension to another. Andrew Avraham, a beloved husband, father, grandfather, and one of the unfortunately smaller group remaining of Holocaust survivors. In the Torah portion that we read last week, this week, the week of Andrew's passing, it talks about the story of the Jewish people getting into Egypt, the challenges, the slavery, the difficulties, the ups, the downs, and eventually, in this week's portion, the exodus from Egypt. And I think the story of the Torah portion is really the story of Andrew. Andrew was born May 15, 1928, in Budapest, Hungary. And he was born in a time that was a good time initially. Family was involved, active in the Jewish community. They did well. And then there was the quote unquote Egypt mode. When everything turned around, the most difficult of times, the, uh, the Holocaust that he experienced himself. I'm sure we'll hear more about it from the family but it was an individual that lived through the most horrific of times, yet not only miraculously survived, but had that drive to keep on moving forward. And after the Holocaust came back to his birthplace, Budapest, and rebuilt and worked hard and met his wife, Katalin, who I understand was 16 when they met or got engaged and married when she was 17. Andrew was 20. And as they say, the rest is history, being married for 73 years. But that journey, those ups and downs, those going into Egypt and out, continued again. After marrying in 1948, the birth of their first son in 1949, they again experienced upheaval and they literally escaped, ran away from Budapest in 1956, eventually arriving in Chicago, where he again rebuilt, moved forward the birth of Robert and the seeing of children, grandchildren, and not only surviving, but doing everything he can for his family. I have some fond memories 
of Andrew coming to shul together with Katalin and Shabbos. He had a des designated uh, seat in the back. Found out there was a little secret why he sat in the back. It's near the exit. But everyone loved to see them, both Andrew and Katalin, and say hello and talk. And he shared, he shared with me some of these stories of his youth. I remember him talking about the apples and the shul and the synagogue on Simchas Torah and uh, the memory of his own youth. And even later, when it was difficult for him to come to shul in the last few years, but on occasion, we were able to meet. And he was always happy to put on the tefillin, to say a little prayer, to talk, not much, but a little bit, maybe share a little joke. And you felt that special soul of someone that not just an individual, but someone represents us as a people, someone that represents the story of survival, the story of moving forward, and the story of doing everything for his family. As family was so important to Andrew, I'm going to ask at this time, Robert, share a few words. Try to get through this, no promises. <sighs> Is Harold here? He's going to be my backup. Why don't you join me? Because I'm going to need you. My father, known as Abu, like many of you know, was amazing on many levels. He grew up in Budapest. His father, Henrik, owned factories. Dad talked about having everything a young boy would want until a matter of seemingly seconds is all taken away by the Nazis. He and his dad went to Saturday services and were called up to the Bima during Torah readings. He and his father in Hungarian schnodered, kind of gave money every time that put him in the favored category, ensuring that they were always called up to the bima. As soon as the Don Alam was chanted, just like what he did in services recently, he and his friends took the cue and ran out before our Don Alam was over to return to their mischievous ways. There are many stories that cannot be recounted today in mixed company, where he and his friends climbed trees near the town church. All I can say is the parishioners weren't pleased upon their exiting the church. <laughs> One of his classic stories talks about he and his buddies finding an abandoned wash tub, <sighs> taking it down the river and floating to the next town. His parents were quite upset. When the Nazis invaded Hungary, his lifelong PTSD started. His brother Frank was forced into the Russian army. He and his father were hoarded into the rail cars to the concentration camps. He spent time in Auschwitz and Buchenwald. Marching on the ice-ridden roads, he saw his brother killed and frozen laying in a ditch. Approaching the entry to Buchenwald, he was a state his age, 16. The younger were directed to the left and put to death. He didn't speak German well, and he didn't know the word for 16. He unknowingly repeated in German what the boy in front of him said. It was 17. Could we part? My kids, brother, and I would not be here today if it wasn't for that fortunate mishap. Among the horrors that we all know about, his life was further saved by God's will, luck, good fortune, what have you, by mere seconds. Call it miracles. Number one, he stole burnt potato peels from a garbage can with a friend in his barracks. His friend was caught, took the blame, and was hung. 
his potato peels fell out of his coat. Number two, he was building bunkers when the camps were bombed. He placed a metal bowl on his head to protect himself. Seconds later, he heard shrapnel bounce off the bowl, saving him once again. Number three, walking in wooden shoes and paper socks. He developed gangrene of his toe. He was sent to the infirmary for medical care, not knowing that this was just another entry into the gas chambers. It was five o'clock when he got up to the clinic door. He was turned away and told to return the following day. The American army invaded the camp the next day. The Nazis all ran. My father laid in the fields, weak and malnourished, among the hundreds of dead prisoners. Any army soldier found him and led him to safety and to the end of the internment. I'm better. <laughs> Uppel returned to his hometown, found everything destroyed or taken. He was sheltered by distant relatives. He slowly rebuilt his life by working in a tailor shop. He started school and passed two grades in one year to catch up with his education. He sat by his friend who was fluent in shorthand who completed his exams and helped him pass his class. He would sneak upstairs to another classroom to another friend who helped him pass another subject. My father always had a saying to get things done. If it's not this way, then it's that way. He always found solutions to his challenges throughout life. After he joined the Hungarian army, becoming an officer, he met my mother at a military dance. She had a horrible cold, kind of like a cold today, <laughs> but he still became enamored with her. They soon married in 1948, and my brother Tom, a year later, was born. Dad talks about racing sidecar motorcycles, spinning in circles, and ending up flying into a tree. He learned automobile mechanics, which later became his career. Escaping to the U.S. via Austria in 1956 started their true freedom. Dad worked odd jobs, washed cars, and finally was able to start working as a mechanic. They arrived in New York to Aunt Olga, Uncle Art, whose daughter and grandkids are listening remotely today, and then came to Chicago meeting their friends who had already arrived. That's you. <laughs> My brother and I had different upbringings as I was born in the US. He came across the borders with my parents and saw firsthand their struggles to survive. My becoming a doctor is 100% the fault of my father. When I was seven years old, I was massaging my father's feet on a Sunday afternoon while he was watching TV in bed. Our conversation led him to saying, you should be a doctor, your hands are so strong. Well, the rest is history as far as I'm concerned. He worked many nights and weekends fixing cars in our driveway and was proud to say that he paid the $100 a day of medical school tuition. Dad drove regularly to, any, to my medical school dorm, bringing me home cooked food and clean laundry. Yes, he and mom spoiled me. He got off on the wrong floor once and while walking up a few flights of stairs, a head of lettuce fell out of the bag and rolled back down. I think he cursed but laughed when he told me the story later. I remember his pulling my sled up and down the alleys of Skokie in the winter. I can only imagine how tiring that was, but it was sure fun for me. During medical school, he and I would be walking again in the snow. I would recite my lessons to him. Of course, he didn't know what I was talking about, but he let me talk and review everything. I was studying with him. He was very dedicated and devoted to me and was always my main cheerleader. Dad was in love with mom as much as the day they met up until his last days. They held hands a couple weeks ago while we drove them to an appointment. He always supported mom and they were emotionally joined at the hip for their 73 year long marriage. He suffered severe PTSD in my younger years. His torment could only be released by him literally breaking things in our home. This was a very tough period. It was much later that he was able to tell his stories and his inner demons calmed to some extent. He never stopped thinking and talking about his experiences and always missed his brother and father. Home stretch. 
Dad was not very talkative compared to my social, fun-loving mother. He became a very gentle man, always telling me, I love you more than you love me. That was a tough one. He hid dollar bills in my first car to surprise me. His belly laughs watching classic 1970s TV shows, something I'll never forget. He taught me how to drive as I sat in his lap coming home from Hebrew school. Coming home from work. <laughs> this is funny. He, he frequently took a bath. <laughs> the tub was above our kitchen. <laughs> We would start at dinner waiting for him to come down. All I can say in this <laughs> environment, the porcelain echoing sounds of his digestion <laughs> cracked us up to this day. <sighs> There's so many other stories that can be shared, but time and exhausted emotions do not allow for them today. Please take my father's life experiences, love for his family, and his ability to laugh. Keep up in your prayers. <laughs> Thank you for Thank coming. You. <laughs> Done. Thank you. And I just wanted to say that when Rob and I met um, in our young teenage years, we realized that we had a lot in common because my parents are Holocaust survivors with similar stories of survival and um, I always considered Rob's parents like my second parents. We'll continue with the reciting of Psalm 23. First, I'll read it in Hebrew, and then we'll all read it together in English. Mizmar le David, Adinai ra'i loy echsar, binais deshayar bitseni, amei menuchais yenahaleni. Nafshi yeshevev yancheni v'mag le tzedek l'man shemoi. Kam ki elech begeitz halmaves, loy idera ki atay madi. Shiftecha umishantecha heima yanachamuni. Tarech lefanai shulchan neget seiruroi. Vishanta vashemen roishi kaisi revaya. Ach toi vachesed yudifuni kol yame chayoi. Vishafti beves adinoi lo erech yamim. If you open your little pamphlets, we have Psalm 23 on the second page. The Lord is my shepherd. I shall not want. He maketh me lie down in green pastures. He leadeth me beside the still waters. He restoreth my soul. He leadeth me in the path of righteousness for his namesake. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for thou art with me. Thy rod and thy staff, they comfort me. Thou preparest a table before me in the presence of mine enemies. Thou anointest my head with oil. My cup runneth over. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life, and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. At this point, we're going to rise for the Kelmale Memorial Prayer. Eil Malay Rahamim, Shaykhin Mereimim, Hamse Menuchanachino, Alkan Fiashino, the Miles Kedashim with the Hidim, Kezayar Harakia, Mazhidim Es Nishmas, Avraham Ben Chaim, Shaholach Lailamoi, Bavur Shanachno Mispalim, Baad Haskaras Nishmasoi, Bigane then Tahimunuchasoi, Lachain bal harachamim, yastireyhu, viseser kenof of liay lamim. Vitzrar, vitzrar hachaim es nishmosoi, adenai hu nachalosoi, vianoch hamishkavi bishalaim, vinaymar amen. 
God full of compassion who dwells on high, grant true rest on the wings of the Shekhinah, the divine presence, in the exalted spheres of the holy and pure, who shine as the brightness of the firmament unto the soul of Andrew Wolf, Avraham ben Chaim, who has gone to his world and for whose memory we pray. May his soul be in a place of rest in Gan Eden. Therefore, may the Almighty One shelter him with the cover of his wings and bind his soul in the bond of eternal life. The Lord is his heritage. May he rest in his resting place in peace. And let us say, Amen. Ladies and gentlemen, the interment service will continue at Waldheim Jewish Cemetery in Forest Park. Should be about a 40 minute ride. The Shiva will be at Mission Hills Country Club at 1677 West Mission Hills Road in Northbrook. It will be today following the interment and then Friday at the Wolf Residence at 1740 Mission Hills Road, apartment 509. That's also in Northbrook from 12 noon to 3.30. Memorial contributions to the Illinois Holocaust Museum. That information you can find on the service folder. And for those of you who are joining us online, all that information is on our website. For those of you who will be driving in the funeral procession to the cemetery, the procession will be forming in our parking lot. Please obtain an orange safety funeral sticker to place on the right-hand side of your windshield. Have your bright lights and hazard lights on at all times. For additional measures of safety, we will be providing many of the cars with a flag that will be affixed to the top portion of your car. We'll have a car in the back of the procession to hopefully keep other cars from entering the procession. And for your own personal safety, I strongly recommend using your horn liberally as you're going through the intersections. Please do not speak or text on your cellular phone while driving to a cemetery. This time I invite his grandchildren to come forward to serve as pallbearers. I ask everyone to please rise and stand in place as we escort the casket of Mr. Andrew Wolf from the chapel. Then you may return to your cars.